Um, I want to talk about three avalanche accidents, one of which is the square top avalanche that Andrew just shared with us um, that took place this past winter <coughs> in the Wasatch. Um, as I discuss these, I'm going to weave together my 30 plus year career and how these accidents impacted me in our community. But before I go forward, um, a, a disclaimer, and I just want to be careful how I read this. In no way is any grief I encountered similar to the grief endured by those that knew the victims or may have been involved in these accidents. I'm speaking with great humility and respect for those involved in these accidents and hope I can humbly share a story <clears throat> about how these three accidents affected me and our community, as well as highlight the admiration I have for those that do backcountry search and rescue work. A uh, bit of my back, background, I moved to Salt Lake in 1990 from northern New England and instantly fell in love with skiing powder, uh, but knew nothing about avalanches. And fortunately, through some mentorship with the UAC, uh, about mid-90s, I began doing field observations for the UAC, as well as working as an educator for the UAC, as well as other organizations in, around the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, I've been working as a part-time forecaster for the Salt Lake office of the UAC since 2015. Um, an unorthodox path, I think, to becoming a professional. Uh, I took a level one when I moved here in 1990. Quite honestly, I wasn't ready. I didn't have the background. Sarah was talking earlier about the, the language we have for um, the snow and avalanche world, and I didn't know that language. So I didn't get much out of that class. And in my first few years, I lost a few very close friends, um, as well as some people I knew peripherally, and really impacted me. Um, I reached a decision point that I could continue doing what I was doing, that is, proceeding probably with a lot of luck, without the necessary skills, um, or I could learn more. So one afternoon, I cold called Tom Kimbrough, who was a forecaster at the UAC at the time, and I asked if I could join him on one of his field days. Uh, Tom didn't know me at the time, but he welcomed me and was happy to have me go along. And while we were out that day, um, he said, you should begin submitting observations for the UAC. You seem to get out a lot. You should share what you know. And I said, I, I don't know how to submit observations. And he laughed. For those of you who know, know Tom, you can imagine him laughing. He laughed. He said, well, you certainly will learn. Um, and over the next 10 years, um, looking at snow, understanding snow, understanding avalanches became synonymous with the joy of skiing. Uh, I did take a level one again in the mid-90s, got so much more out of it and just continued to do tons of field work for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, in 2011, I took my level three. In 2015, the UAC contacted me to see if I'd be interested in working as a part-time forecaster uh, to, to meet staffing needs. And I've always held snow safety professionals in very high regard. So with a heavy dose of imposter syndrome, I called my now very good friend, Tom Kimbrough, and asked him if he felt I was up to it. Tom's support that day meant the world to me. Uh, as I was going into this new role, I felt that his support uh, gave me the confidence I needed to go forward. But one thing Tom told me that it, after, afterwards, it, uh, it makes sense, seems so obvious, but at the time it wasn't obvious, was be prepared for someone to die on one day you write a forecast. On January 8th, 2021, this past January, Kevin Jack Steuben was killed in an avalanche in Dutch Draw along the Park City Ridge Line. I wrote the forecast that morning. I don't know if Kevin and his partner had read the forecast. Regardless, I was shaken by that event. I spent the rest of the day reading, rereading that forecast. I probably read it a thousand times. Before I talk about a few other events, um, I've had probably conservatively well over 2,000 days in the backcountry in avalanche terrain. That's a significant amount of experience. I've never been caught in an avalanche. I've never been involved in an avalanche accident. And I've never performed a real avalanche rescue. I, I'm not saying this boastfully. I, it, if anything, just the opposite, with great humility. Um, whereas I do want to think that my lack of involvement in an avalanche accident has been due to good decision making. I'm also pretty conservative. Um, all you have to do is ask those that tour with me regularly and they'll smile and say, yep, he's pretty conservative. Um, and to be honest, I've had a lot of luck, particularly early in my career. I think the several days I came home that I probably just got away with it. <clears throat> I've always felt that as I stepped into the role of being a professional that not having been involved in an avalanche in an avalanche accident in performing a rescue did, 
didn't give me the credentials to be a true professional. Now, mind you, I'm not looking to get involved in an avalanche accident, but that unless I had this kind of experience, there would always be something I'd be missing, that I'd be lacking to fully understand what it was like to be involved in an avalanche, um, uh, to perform a real rescue, to, to deal with the survivors. <clears throat> On January 30th, 2021, as we just heard Andrew talk about, Kurt Damschroeder was killed in an avalanche on Square Top. This was again along the Park City Ridge Line. The day after, I went with UAC colleagues, uh, Trent Meisenheimer and Chad Brackelsberg, to do a site investigation. It's the first time I had visited the site of an avalanche fatality. Once the Summit County Search and Rescue had um, taken Kurt down off of the mountain, we went in to do our work. This was just facts, doing a snow profile, getting the dimensions of the avalanche, the slope angle, my comfort zone, a place I'm comfortable, comfortable in. Once we completed our investigation, uh, I went up above the crown, and if you look at the, the slide here, it's um, that circle in the top center of the screen. And I stood alongside uh, Kurt's final track. This was, um, Andrew was just talking about this, this very location just a, just a few moments ago. I was alone for several minutes during that time, and I just looked down the slope. Uh, I was asking myself, what would I have done had, had I been with Kurt that day? I'm not gonna share my answer, it's irrelevant. But it gave me a sense of that you have to be honest with yourself. Uh, Andrew talked about this as well just a, a short while ago. You have to be honest with yourself when you're in avalanche terrain. How will you behave? How will you communicate? It was a profoundly emotional moment for me, and I think it was perhaps the first time that I truly felt the profound impacts of the immensity of the loss that took place that day, that takes place in an avalanche accident. A week later, uh, February 6th, Wilson Glade along the Mill Creek Big Cottonwood Ridge Line. Uh, seven caught, six fully buried, four fatalities. I didn't have the good fortune of knowing Kevin or Kurt or Lewis or Stephanie or Sarah or Thomas, but I knew them. I knew why they're out that day. I knew why Kevin and his partner had gone to Dutch Draw. I knew why Kurt and Andrew had gone to uh, Square Top. I knew why Lewis and Stephanie and Sarah and Thomas had gone into uh, Wilson Glade along with the two other parties. I knew why. I think we all do. If you're watching tonight, you get it. We all do. We all understand. The day after the accident, I went in again, um, this time UAC colleagues, Trent and Nikki Champion, um, along with others from um, the community, guide educator Cody Hughes and uh, search and rescue personnel from Salt Lake County. We went in, uh, UAC went in to do our site investigation and also assist uh, as it was a pretty massive re uh, recovery effort to, to get the bodies down um, from, the, from the site. I was expecting a difficult day, but that morning I was determined to remain stoic and professional. I want to single out a few people, though, that talked to me that day. First off is Dave Richards, uh, Grom, as some of you may know. Uh, Dave is the director of the Avalanche Program at Alta. Dave has seen far too many of these types of accidents. And, and Dave has spoken very well of the cumulative effects of visiting these accidents and, and the toll that they, that they take on you. Dave is as tough and as tender as they come. On the approach into Wilson Glade, I was skinning along with Dave and I had commented that the week before I had visited the site of my first fatality and how it impacted him. I was still processing it, um, but it, it, it had impacted me pretty profoundly. And Dave stopped, stopped me, and he looked me right in the eyes and put his hand on my shoulder and said, you don't have to do this. It's okay. If it's too difficult for you, it's okay to turn around and go home. It's okay. We get it. I get it. Dave gave me permission that day to acknowledge the emotions that I would feel. Um, I've thanked Dave personally a few times, and if you're watching tonight, Dave, I wanna thank you again. Uh, what you shared with me that day helped me so much in going forward. Um, 
what, two other people from Search and Rescue. One, Mike, I actually don't know Mike's last name, um, but it's one of the Search and Rescue folks, and I was asking him, I was commenting on how he was carrying himself that day, that uh, he was doing difficult work. It was, a, it was a very somber day, as you can imagine. He was, we were all doing some difficult work. Um, but he was just talking with other people, and um, um, Dave, uh, Mike was taking care of himself. And Mike had told me that we do this work, search and rescue people, we do this work for the friends and families of the victims, that bringing their loved ones down out of the mountains is the first step in their journey towards grief and ultimately healing. Finally, Ryan Clerico, who was the incident commander that day, kept on telling us throughout the day, make sure that we had enough food, that we have water. If we were cold, put on a jacket. Uh, if you were tired, take a break. The, the eight of us that were uh, on the site that day, we all had vast amount of backcountry experience. We knew how to take care of ourselves in the winter. Ryan was talking to us, just keeping an eye on us. Just, just, it's just a way that professionals watch out for one another. Um, I, I, just his messages throughout the day really helped me through that, through that very difficult day. So how did our community respond? Um, this is a photo from Wilson Glade looking into Alexander Basin taken this past fall. Lovely fall that we were able to enjoy here in the Wasatch. Um, there were celebrations of life for Kevin and Kurt and Lewis and Thomas and Stephanie and Sarah. It's my hope that those that knew and loved these six people are far along on their journey towards finding peace. In the backcountry, well, um, this is a photo of Cardiac Bowl. Uh, most winters, midwinter, day or two after a storm, you couldn't tell the difference between Cardiac Bowl and a bumped out area to ski area. There's so many people that go into this kind of terrain. But the, the, uh, the number of avalanches we're having in the backcountry, these accidents, they took a toll on people. And people largely were avoiding avalanche terrain. Um, they were, if, for those that were still backcountry skiing and, and just traveling in the backcountry, they were going to safer areas in, in mid Big Cottonwood Canyon, for example. But um, big avalanche terrain was being left alone. Uh, I had some friends that just, they stopped skiing. It was too dangerous a year. Sure enough, um, 12 days after, about 12 days after this photo was taken, um, uh, we went through a pretty significant avalanche cycle and the UAC issued two days of extreme danger ratings with black roses. What have I learned? Um, this has affirmed my commitment to forecasting and education. Uh, I, I, I play a small role in this community, but I feel the role I do play, however small it is, is important. And I feel a responsibility that I can share what I know with our community. I also look forward to learning from our community. Um, we heard Sarah open tonight. Uh, I admire Sarah so much. I aspire to be like Sarah. So I continue to learn from Sarah. Every time I hear her speak, I learn something. I look forward to uh, learning more from my peer and peers and colleagues here at the UAC. Tomorrow night, Francine Mullen is going to give a talk about that big avalanche cycle that we went through in February. I look forward to listening to that and learning. Also, I look forward to learning from a BC 101 student that I'll have this winter, whom I haven't met yet. But she'll be out on one of her first days in the backcountry, and uh, we'll make a comment, we'll make an observation that never occurred to me before. I look forward to that. It's really made me admire the dedication of the difficult work search and rescue people do. Uh, and then finally, I look forward to 30 plus more accident-free years. I'm always a little reluctant to share advice, um, so bear with me for, for a little bit here. Uh, these are some, some thoughts that I've had that um, I, I think for someone who's listening and can say, well, how can I learn more about this? So visiting the scene of an avalanche, I should say safely. So if you can visit the scene of an avalanche, it doesn't have to be an accident. Uh, it can just be an avalanche occurrence. Go, go look at that avalanche. Look at Look at the size of it. Look, um, pick up one of those blocks of snow, just a, which is on the scale of the, of the avalanche. It's tiny. Pick up one of those. Try to pick up one of those blocks of snow. It gives you such an enormous respect for the power of these avalanches. Communicate. Um, I'm not going to talk more about communication. Andrew said it perfectly. 
Uh, I am an advocate of planning, of pre-trip planning and then post-trip debrief. Um, Sarah Carpenter has actually spoken quite well on this. With pre-trip planning, uh, you, get, you gain information, and as you're planning for the next day, you have three types of terrain you can, that you uh, can go to. So one is, based upon all the data you have, to your, um, your go-to terrain, saying that, well, well, from what we know right now, here's some terrain that we can go to tomorrow. You also have some uh, standby or on-call terrain that, well, based upon what you see during the day, maybe you can slowly step out into that. I think, Craig, you were talking about, Sarah referring to it as like mini, playing mini golf. Uh, and then finally you have, and this is the most important one, you have your no-go terrain. You have terrain that you said you are not gonna go into no matter how good it looks, no matter how much data you get that confirms that you probably could go to that terrain you're not gonna go there. Maybe you're gonna go there tomorrow, but that day, you're not gonna go there. Post-trip debrief. At the end of the day, talk about, did you make good decisions? Um, Lynn Wolf <coughs> speaks about, yeah, did we make good decisions or did we just get away with it? Be honest with yourselves. Um, I think of myself as an optimistic person, but I have a pessimistic view of a snowpack. The, the glass is half empty. I think the snowpack is dangerous. I think it's, it's weak. When, when, when I'm out, I need to see overwhelming evidence of stability. So have a, have a glass that's half empty, have a pessimistic view of the snowpack, and look for overwhelming signs of, of stability. If I don't see overwhelming signs of stability, I back off. That's the conservative part of me. Finally, further your education. You're doing this right now by uh, attending USA. I hope, you, I hope you went last night and looking forward to tomorrow night as well. Um, take a search and rescue class. Take a, uh, Avalanche Rescue has, has branched so much with this, so many opportunities now for, you don't have to go on a pro track, there's, re, there's uh, recreational courses for uh, level one, uh, recre recreation level two, so further your education. I want to conclude with a quote from Emily Coombs. <clears throat> um, Emily had lost her partner, Doug, a few weeks before she said this. Um, Doug had died in a steep skiing accident in France. You know, the mountains are full of dangers and they swallow you up, but mostly the mountains, they give. This is a thank you to the organizations that um, uh, took part in the rescue and recovery work uh, in these three avalanche accidents this past, this past winter. And my sincere thanks for all the dedicated professionals that did this work. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Wow, man. Powerful. Powerful, powerful. Greg, it's, it's always an honor to, to share time with you, share the stage, and um, to hear all of this, this information and, of course, this insight that you have and you can deliver so eloquently to uh, our community. You've worn a couple of different hats. You know, you start out as backcountry skier, now you're a forecaster, you know, you're somebody who writes the forecast. Do you look at snow any differently, morphing from one to the other, morphing from a recreationist to a professional? Um, no. Uh, if whenever I look at snow, uh, I'm looking at it from the perspective of, of a professional. Um, there are days that um, working as a snow professional, can, uh, it, it can take a toll. And there are some days that I don't actually want to think about it. I don't want to uh, be, in the, be in the situation where I have to be making decisions about, all right, this slope is 36 degrees and digging pits and looking for stability. There's some days that I just, I need a, I need a mental break from that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ski some 25 degree slopes. I'm actually not gonna look at the snow. I'm just gonna enjoy skiing. Um, when I'm out working professionally, when I'm doing UAC work, <clears throat> uh, I'm looking at the snow with, an eye, as, with the eye of a professional. Um, my friends that will ski with me on those days, I, they often roll their eyes, oh goodness, he's gonna dig another pit. Um, but I think that's the work that you have to wear uh, when working professionally. Yeah, there are some days that I'm blurring, blurring the lines. Um, but I do feel it's really important that I can separate days that I can just be a, a backcountry skier, just looking for uh, a day in the mountains, that I actually need that mental break 
Um, and then some days when I'm working professionally, I'm very engaged. Um, I'm actually not skiing much. I'm spending so much time looking at the snow. For me, that's worked. I, I don't, others, I, I don't know, but for me, that, that, that model's worked pretty well. Right on. Thanks for that. Um, man, diving into the accidents that, that you have and writing these reports and, and really seeing firsthand how they affect people. Um, how do you think that's going to make you a potentially safer backcountry skier? I'm going to echo uh, some of Andrew's thoughts. Um, when you're younger, and for those of you that are 25 and listening, you're whatever, you may be rolling your eyes, but um, when I was there, uh, there's someone here who are 25. When I was there, um, when I was at that age, um, yeah, I felt I was invincible. And then losing, losing two friends, two very close friends, really impacted me. Uh, and I, I pre pretty quickly, I felt that I needed to learn more. I, I wanted to continue to ski the backcountry. Um, I found it, uh, there was just, there, it, was, it was my passion. Um, and, I, and I found looking at snow and avalanches, I uh, became very passionate about that as well. Um, so I didn't want to change, I didn't want to stop, but I knew I had to learn more. Um, but part of that learning was just backing off. And, and if I had any doubt, any doubt whatsoever, there's such a difference between a 33 degree slope and a 25 degree slope. I'm gonna to go to that 25 degree slope. So I, I think I just have naturally become more, more cautious. Um, but losing people, um, losing good friends of mine really had an impact on me. Um, when I'm teaching an avalanche class, uh, I feel I have those friends with me. It's a, it's a, a surreal experience, but I feel I have them with me um, and that I'm, uh, uh, I'm doing it for them, I'm doing it with them. Right on. Um, I think we've got time for another one here. And so prior to maybe taking a Backcountry 101 or a Level 1, you want to get the biggest bang out of your buck. And how do you think somebody could build some knowledge or a knowledge base or a skill set base so that they can uh, take the most advantage out of those classes? Um, good question. So the best way to learn is by getting into the mountains. Um, I, I know when I started out, uh, I was actually joining people that were um, just as unaware as I was, just as clueless as I was. And I didn't seek out going with people who had more experience. So going with people who have more experience, I think, is great. But the communication becomes really important. Um, one of the, we talk about these human factors. And one of the human factors um, that becomes evident in so many avalanche accidents is the expert halo. So you're out with someone who has far more experience with you. And they're looking at a slope. And it looks great to them. And um, maybe you don't have much experience. But there's something about it that makes you feel really uncomfortable. Um, we often talk about with communication to listen to the quietest voice. I mean, think about that for a minute. Listen to the quietest voice. So if, if, you, if you do choose to go out with others that have more experience than you, ask them questions. Um, if you have concerns, raise those concerns. Um, if you feel they're not listening to you, find other partners. So I think, I think getting out with people who know more uh, is, is very useful, but choose your partners carefully. <clears throat> Uh, I also think we do a really nice job at the UAC of trying to provide education just through our blogs and our forecasts. Um, there are so many observations, public observations that are posted that you can learn so much as well. So I think through a combination of things you can find online through the UAC site and partners, uh, I think you can actually get a pretty good sense, pretty good background, um, pretty good sense that would give you going into a BC 101 class or a level one.